everyone, William Nichols here for another awesome, awesome interview. I'm super, super pumped to have my good friend Michael here with us. He is at Holder of the Fire on Twitter, so make sure you go follow him. Michael, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I uh, appreciate the invitation on uh, this beautiful Saturday, and I, uh, you know, based on our conversations in the past. I know this will probably be a very, very good conversation. So as soon as you uh, asked me to do this, I said to myself, this would probably end up being really good. So I am excited uh, today. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the um, the uh, accolades. You're too kind. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, bro. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so for people who don't know, I mean, you've been in the, the finance world for a very, very long time. And uh, you've got a lot of really cool expertise. So could you kind of explain a little bit about your background and how you got started in kind of finance, trading, sales, that sort of area? And then we can talk about All that. Right. Derek, so. Yes. So I'm a little older uh, than probably uh, most people listening to this. I just turned 44, a young 44, I may add. And... Um, so I got into the industry, um, stockbroker. When I was um, 19, I was uh, working at a deli at the time, and I looked up an ad in the paper, and I saw, you know, the market was booming at the time. Uh, the atmosphere in the 90s was like any, like, unlike any other. You know, I like to call the 90s uh, peak Americana, mm -hmm. and um, there was a vibe at that time that... Uh, we could only hope that we could replicate again. And, you know, it, it'll never be exactly the same, but at least, you know, we hope that it could rhyme. So I answered an ad in the paper, and I ended up working for some chop shop uh, run by gangsters. And in that, uh, you know, that was my introduction to the industry. I'm not going to get into full details, but uh, let's just say it was a very, very interesting experience. And um, the guys I learned from, as far as sales go, um, were absolute all-stars. And, you know, the things I was seeing at this place were more surreal. And I'm not just saying this to, like, hype things up. Like, the things I was seeing in this place were more surreal than what you even saw in Jordan Belfort's movie. Like, crazy, crazy stuff. But uh, with that being said, these guys were the best of the best uh, when it comes to sales. So I got a really good, you know, my first week on the phone. Um, I made like eight to ten grand, and um, holy shit! Yeah, I was uh, right off the bat. I got on the phone and I started closing people. And you know, it was a, uh, it was, um, you know, the animal spirits were alive and well at that time. So yep. after a little while, I figured out that uh, things weren't on the up and up. I uh, was outside and I had pictures being taken of me, and wow. you know, I kind of figured, yeah, I kind of figured out that uh, things weren't exactly great. So I left. Um, then I went to a uh, legit company. Uh, you know, I did everything. Everything w was by the book after that. I spent about 15 years on uh, Wall Street. I learned, you know, the people I learned from at various different places, I uh, consider some of the most impressive people that I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, in this in industry, you meet a lot of larger uh, than life individuals, like people who came from nothing and transformed themselves into uh, people that are worth eight, nine, uh, ten figures in some cases. So, uh, you know, when you meet these people, you know, you're, and you can't help... how old were you, you when you started on Wall Street, approximately? Nineteen. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. a good experience right there. Yeah. As a 19-year-old uh, around man, The people I met, you know, when you meet these charismatic, magnetic... Um, just people who could inspire you with their words. Um, you know, when you see that, you ask yourself, like, how did they become that way? Right. And it doesn't just happen. It's um, it's a lot of inner work that goes into that. So, yeah, that's how I got onto Wall Street. I uh, spent 15, 15 years on Wall Street. I also came up during the bear market uh, of 2000 and 2003. So that's how I learned how to trade uh, because I was losing everybody money at the time. So I had to go through a three-year long, horrendous bear market that's, that pretty much killed my soul uh, because yeah. it was so brutal and long. 
But yeah, I learned how to trade uh, through various people, uh, people online, people offline. And uh, yeah, that's how I built my initial skill set. But I would say, in closing, uh, the most important thing I think I learned at that time, uh, at least, you know, not just at that time, but in the business, is um, like the inner work takes precedence over everything else. Yep. Like I could give you the scripts, I could teach you what to say, it doesn't matter. And I think a lot of people miss that when they teach sales because it's all about the intangibles and it's all about how you are on the inside that really takes that to the next level. For sure, which kind of transitions into another area that I want to talk to you about, um, which is the inner game because I think that's super, super important. And um, that's definitely what I've noticed. Like the, uh, the most successful clients that I work with the reason that they were successful is because we just hammered home on the mindset stuff and we cleared all those subconscious blocks and basically created an entirely new identity. And then from there, they're able to create, you know, these crazy results in their life, um, like 10 xing their income and crazy stuff like that. And it's all because of the inner game. And I've been saying this to people for a long time. I know you talk about this a lot, especially in regards to sales and finance and trading and, and all that. Um, can you kind of touch on what you define as the inner game and how does someone begin to do that work? Because everyone talks, like when, when people talk about it, they talk about it as as just that, the inner game, right? It's like the inner game mindset, man. Get your mindset right, get your inner game right. But no one, no one's able to describe, you know, in details what that actually means and how to actually start doing that. And that's the stuff that I like to talk about. So I want to hear kind of your definition of what the inner game is and how you basically worked on that inner game to to create you know a lot of success in your own life absolutely and you know it's a it's an interesting question because it's not something that my my inner game tactics have developed like to this day yep. as you know um they are still developing and even though i'm an older man or, or or you know older i'm not a kid anymore um i am still constantly growing constantly and that's you know a little off topic. It's one of the reasons why I love to be on Twitter because it keeps my mind fresh and uh, keeps me, you know, keeps me motivated. I see what other people are doing out there, younger people. And, uh, you know, seeing these things, different new ways of making money and all that is all positive stuff. And it keeps you from stagnation. Uh, you know, I notice a lot of people my age, they stagnate. Some people stagnate much earlier, at like 25 years old, which is horrible. Uh, so what, back to the main question. So yeah, that's like, that's something that has evolved uh, so much and it, it starts off really basic it starts off with positive thinking it starts off with visualization it starts off with having a why and just wanting it like that fire inside you like when you're Burning young desire, you can be guided. Yeah. yeah when you're young you have a certain amount of ambition uh, and ambition alone can guide you and you know a beautiful thing about um, that inner game you know I can't tell you how many people I've seen I've trained a few People who came into the business unsure, unconfident, uh, you know, when they when they came in, they weren't dressed properly, not even the, the price of what they were wearing, like they weren't well put together, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And when you started working on their mindset, when you started teaching them to be killers, I like to call them. And what I mean by that is uh, someone who's intently focused, uh, someone who has a why, uh, someone who sets high standards for themselves. And, you know, you start off with the basic stuff in the beginning. And then, you know, as you evolve as a person, as you, uh, if you continue down this path, it, it naturally takes you into esoterics, in my opinion. And I've seen it happen so many times. Like, all the most successful people mm -hmm. that I've seen in this business, that I, they may, they're not religious, so to say, but they have their spiritual game on point. And, you know, I wish I could introduce you to some of the people that I've met along the way I'm talking powerful powerful presence and uh, people that can um, don't have to raise their voice one bit and yep. just sound extremely powerful and get things done like everything comes from who they are inside they don't need to fluctuate they don't need to do all the sales stuff they are just so inherently powerful that when they speak respect is given when they walk in the room respect mm -hmm. is given but back to the main topic so you start off small uh, with the basic stuff, you have persistence, you don't give up, um, you, you have standards for yourself. And I can't tell you how many people I've trained and seen train that when they started doing this stuff, everything changed about them. I'm talking actual physical 
changes over the course of three to six months. Like watching that person who looked unconfident and unsure of himself, when we instilled these beliefs, whether it was me with someone doing it or if it was someone else doing it for them, when you instilled those beliefs and they started to believe, you would actually see their physical, like the micro expressions on their face change. Yep. Like they would actually- They look different. They look different, bro. It is crazy. And it, it's not uh, even like the clothes look... change or the hair changes or anything. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Not, not just, but not just like the stuff you could control, like the stuff you wouldn't think yeah. you can control. They have actual physical changes, like the way they look, their eyes are more intense. They, you know, they go from, uh, from unsure to like a hunter, like you're a prey now, like they're looking at everything, you know, you know what I'm saying? Not necessarily the prey or a predator, but they got that focused look. They had their micro expressions change. Everything changed. They did dress nicer. And, you know, I think, um, you know, all this stuff plays into each other, right? Like the outer game is also very important. There is a saying that you are judged by a person before you even open your mouth in the first six seconds that they look at you, they form an opinion on you. Mm-hmm. So what does that tell you? That tells you you also have to have what I like to call pre-frame. And uh, I define pre-frame as the way you dress, the way you move, the way you speak, the way you carry yourself. And, um, you know, so it's not just the inner game. It's the outer game that it's the inner game influences the outer game. The yep. outer game influences the inner game. And so it's like a synergistic process, if you know what I'm saying. For sure. And, you know, just to top that off, that statement. Uh, yeah, it starts off really simple, like reading books like Think and Grow Rich and uh, Greatest Salesman in the World and the basic stuff like Master Key. And then, like I said, if you're a curious person like myself and you and um, people that I surround myself with, uh, eventually it's going to, if you stay on this path, it just becomes about, and I'm not sitting here saying um, I've made a ton of mistakes in life, believe me when I tell you. Yeah, we and all I have. still continue. Yeah, and I continue to make uh, mistakes. I've done a lot of self-inflicted damage in my life because uh, I like to party, I like to chill, and uh, some of those habits got out of hand uh, in, at points in my life. But I will say, as you stay on this path, uh, it, it becomes about self-mastery in every aspect if you stay on it, and you will do nothing. It'll never end. There will always be something else. Yeah, and do you think that that's kind of the bridge of where, because I've seen it too, where a lot of people that are really into um, sales, persuasion, speaking, um, just business even, just like running a business and being entrepreneurs, uh, they tend to, in one way or another, find that spiritual path. And I think that has a lot to do with energy because when you understand energy in sales and persuasion and business, um, and you understand that it's literally all a game of energy, then you start to, that naturally bleeds into those other areas. And then the other aspect of that, though, is is too just um, the idea of constant constant improvement. So, do you think do you think one is more important than the other? Like, because I would prioritize uh, energy, but then I would say, you know, you improve your energy by constant improvement. So they kind of seem to be, you know, intermingled yeah. in that way. So, if you look and you know at the top visionaries in the world, and you know, in the field that I'm in, the top traders, for example, uh, they are all very introspective. They are all hyper aware. And I would say, like you said, they, they have a vision. And, um, you know, to, to be a visionary person, you have to have a heavy imagination, number one. And then, yes, it all, you know, at the end of the day, whether people realize it or not, it always comes down to energy. Because what is persuasion at the end of the day? Again, it's not words. It is not it really is an energy transference that's what it is you are wielding and bending energy to get people to do what you want i don't like to use the word manipulation but that's what it is and when i say manipulation it doesn't mean in a negative way yeah not in a negative sense but what you're doing people are coming at you with something it's like picking up a girl it's like negotiating with your girlfriend or your wife you're getting thrown something and your job is to mold that in a way where it doesn't cause friction or confrontation and, you know, that is an energy game. That's all it is. And I used to do phone sales. I still do phone sales. And that is, I mean, listen, all sales is an energy game, but phone sales was a little different because you could be anyone you want to be on the phone. Yeah. And, you know, that's what we used to tell. That's what people, that's what my guys who were training me 
when I was first coming up in the business, they would teach you. You could be anyone you want to be on the phone. You've seen the movies. That's exactly yeah. how it is. Yeah. And it's all energy. Like if you, you know, people make the mistake when they got a super wealthy guy on the phone to be, oh, Mr. Johnson, oh, yeah. blah, 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 like kissing his ass. They don't want that, bro. Nope. They, these guys want to be, they want to know that you're an equal. Uh, they want to be, you could, you know how many times I've spoken to billionaires and like came at them hard, throat, yeah. at their throat. Yeah, and they like when you bust anything. their balls. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've had guys threaten to murder me before because I called them out on, the, on this stuff. But, you know, that's the way you have to be. And, um, you know, these guys, they don't want to, yeah, every now and again, you get a guy that, you know, knows, listen, they all know they're giving you a shot, but they don't want to, um, they don't want to feel like they're changing their life. They want to feel like they're doing business with an equal, if yep. you know what I'm saying. And so, yeah, it is an energy game because, like, what sales is, people buy on emotion and they justify on logic. Nobody buys on logic, mm -hmm. especially when you're doing transactional sales over the phone where it's a snap decision right there. And so when I used to call people, you know, there would be times where I would close the guy. I never spoke to him in my life. And the first time I'm ever calling him, and I would get the guy to send me 10 to 50 grand. Think about what that implies. Like, what am I doing? That's not logic, I'll tell you that. Yep. Because it's just not a logical thing to do. You get yeah, it? That's a good point because a lot of people, now, um, I've heard that many, many times, obviously, for, from salespeople. But one of the biggest uh, kind of dif differ from, the way that people differ from that is they'll say that when it's a monetary, uh, if it's like a monetary promise, that then it's logic. But I disagree because I think it's still it's still an emotional basis no, because there's, always... there's all these Im images in their mind associated with that monetary gain, right? Like what what's that going to make them feel like? How's that going to make them see themselves differently, right? Yeah. Listen, you could, you know, you could give them the fear of missing out. You could make them feel like they're part of a special club. Like, but the, all the stuff they do, like if I I would have prospects that I literally gave 10 stocks to that all like crushed it and they wouldn't do business with me. John, I gave you this, I gave you this, I gave you this, I gave you this, like, are you absolutely out of your mind? How are we not yeah. doing business, right? But you get them when you just put on the flair and the drama. Like one of my boys was absolutely amazing at uh, raising money and the thing, the shenanigans, that, and I, I hate to say shenanigans, but they were shenanigans. The shenanigans, and when I say shenanigans, I mean the the dramatic effect that he used to do uh, to get these guys to do huge trades was it, it, it was really interesting to watch. And he used to play it up. And you know, a lot of these guys they just like to be entertained, believe it or not. Yep. You know, they'll send you a million dollars. What's the name of the stock again? What do they do? Like you yep. get what I'm saying? And and people really need to understand that because. They weren't buying the stock. They were buying the performance. And I hate to say that that's how reality works. And it doesn't always work like that, obviously. This yeah. is a little bit different. The business yeah, there's I was a lot of nuance from. with that, of course. Yeah. yeah, there's a huge nuance to that. But in my former business, the people who were the best performers made the most money. Yep. And I've noticed that, that once kind of people move out of survival too then they're more lenient towards either knowledge and like gaining, you know, that, that higher status or whatever. Uh, but once you kind of capped out on that and all the dopamine from that, like there's, you kind of realize it's just like a chasing game. Then what's left? Well, what's left is entertainment, you know, enjoying what's going on right here and right now. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. It's all, it's all, um, it's all performative at some point when you're doing transactional sales like the uh, brokerage industry was it was very performative now i'm not saying that you you didn't use ethics of course you did yeah uh it's a, with a highly regulated business so you had to use ethics but what i'm trying to say is like to get those to get the guy in you know to differentiate yourself from the hundreds of phone calls that they were getting yeah you had to be a performer and he may have not known you were performing but you needed, like I said, it's energy transference. That's what it was. And, you know, the people who understood that are the ones who did best. For sure. For and sure. I feel like we went a little off topic. Did we have a main point uh, that we were trying to get into before, uh, before that? I feel like we well, went we a little bit We were just talking about the inner game, but I wanted to kind of take this and, and move into now building on energy. Um, on the energy of money because a lot of people don't understand money they don't realize how it works they don't realize how to make money 
um, and they have this kind of fictional idea of what money is. And I just see money as energy, and I'm pretty sure you do too. So I kind of want to hear your your perspective on what you think money is and its purpose and its use and kind of seeing it more from that energetic lens um, and why that's important. And to be honest, I've noticed that the biggest players, they all they all see it like that. Like they all see it as yeah. this ebb and flow circulatory thing that's just always in their life, that's always coming around. Sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher, but it, at the end of the day, it's an energy. Yep, it's a it's a measurement of your uh, output and output and your service to the world. I think it's as simple as that. Now, some people are unethical, yeah. and they still make a lot of money, and that's just because they're still putting energetic output out into the world, and um, they're getting something back. Unfortunately, I mean, obviously, it's unfortunate that there are unethical people, but that what money really is when you think about it, uh, the more service you bring to humanity, the um, the more you're going to benefit from that money is a measurement it's a unit of exchange right so yeah. if i want to have more money in my life i need to provide more value and i know it's a bit more esoteric than that in ways but you have to keep it moving i think money likes to um it does like to be moving it likes to be multiplied uh money is uh, very forward thinking as in you know you have to uh you know that's the cool thing about what I, what, you know, my mind, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent at uh, seeing things develop uh, in life and, and trends in itself. You know, when I teach people investing and trading, there's a, there's a line that I always like to hammer into their head. And it has to do with kind of what we're talking about. And what I like to say is what we're trying to do in the market is the anticipation of the law of causation. If you know what I'm saying. So we're trying to anticipate cause and effect, right? For sure. And it's somewhat related to what we're talking about. But money is, uh, I, I, I'm not being really able to articulate what I'm trying to say. But yeah, absolutely, it is. Uh, listen, there's nothing in the world that isn't an energy game. Um, you know, there's stories of people who hit their head and they damaged part of their brains. And when they did, everything they looked at turned into like geometry and, uh, you know, shapes and things like that. So I don't know if the guy just had brain damage or maybe that's what our reality really is. Yeah. It's like when you look at the Matrix, for example, when they have, uh, when Neo finally uh, becomes Neo and he sees all the, uh, whatever you want to call it, the programming on the wall and all that stuff. That's what reality is, right? Like if we all break it down at the end of the day, uh, we are all bits of information moving through the world and the people that come into our lives are attracted to the information that we carry. That information within us can be changed, so we could, we, we have our essence, don't get me wrong, our essence can't be changed, but we could still tweak with our programming to change certain things and live into the best of our essence. And so how that's related to what we were just talking about, how money is energy, everything is energy. Let's talk like, so like when two molecules come together because they're attracted to each other and they mm -hmm. form something and then some things repel each other, right? Yep. But the things that come together, boom, they come together and then they come together with something else that forms something else, right? And then think about it from a lover standpoint or a friend standpoint. When you meet a girl that you're attracted to at her core, uh, that is your information aligning. And uh, chances are, if you, most of the time, not all the time, that girl or that friend that you click so well with, chances are her astrology, numerology, human design are all in sync with yours. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this is all an energy game and it's all a game of affinity and likes attract likes and go on to build other things. And if you don't live within your energy, then you're kind of like creating a hard path for yourself. I always like to say that uh, if you live within your essence, that's when you'll truly be happy. And that is when things will come to you, um, you know, in a, in a frictionless manner. So how does that have to do with money is energy? Everything is energy. Yep. And when you look at things like that, it's like when you do, you know, if you do mushrooms or something, like when you start seeing things, everything looks like it's an energetic pattern, right? Yep. So it's like, I don't know if you wanted me to bring that up on your podcast, but it's, it's the truth. Like it's, uh, it's like. I believe everything in the world around us, like, you know, you know what they say, like, you look at, um, like, this dresser that's next to me right now is not really solid. It's yeah, just it's, lower it's vibrating, vibrating energy, yep. you know? So, um, yeah, the answer you to your up, question is everything is energy, and, of course, money, of all things, uh, would be energy as well. 
Absolutely. You brought up a really good uh, point, and I wanted to kind of deepen that because I, I feel the exact same way. Um, talking a little bit about, uh, y- you mentioned essence. I just call it wiring, right? We have our, we have, everyone's wired for certain things. Um, we are, we have our gifts, you know, everyone has their own gifts and we're wired for specific things. Um, I will never be LeBron James. You know, I'm never going to be Kobe Bryant. I'm not wired for basketball, right? My, my height is not wired for basketball. My DNA is not wired for basketball. Uh, my desire for athletics and the passion for that and the commitment, it's just not, the, the wiring is not there right now. Could I learn basketball? Yes. Could I get really good at basketball? Yes. Will I ever be Kobe Bryant or LeBron James? Hell no. Right. My wiring is just not there. And so a lot of people, um, cause that, that's where we hear this advice, right? Like, uh, you can do anything and yada, yada, yada. Yes. Within, within your reasons, like we all have our gifts and we need to unleash those gifts into the world. And those gifts are unique. I mean, Einstein was obsessed. He got a compass when he was three years old and was obsessed with the magnetic force beyond that needle. And then at three years old, three, was thinking about what if there are other invisible forces that govern nature that are undiscovered? And he spent his entire life, you know, that's that's wiring. That's something that you're, you're born with. Those are innate gifts. Da Vinci was like illiterate because he was a bastard child. And he would just go out to the olive groves and, and steal his father's parchment and just sketch these beautiful articulate drawings like i could never do that like as much time as i could spend trying to draw i'll never have that level of and caliber you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so you touched on that essence and i think that's a really important point because yeah there's a lot of things that we can learn i mean we can learn anything really like you can get moderately to very good at almost anything you know in this world nowadays which is awesome i mean that's one Mm -hmm. of the amazing benefits of technology and information and the internet Uh, but then we also have our have our kind of wiring and now, in, in regards to uh, bringing it back to sales, money, all of that, and the inner game, um, do you think, I, I know it can be conditioned in, but do you think that there are, obviously there's people that are just born to sell, and Absolutely, there are just people right. that are just Absolutely, wired that yeah. way, right? Yeah, it's, listen, um, I believe, and there's a nuance to this, there's always a nuance, right? Yep. I believe that, I, I believe less in free will these days, I believe more in uh, the concept of teleology and things of that nature. And I, I'm not saying there is not free will. I am saying that we are imprinted. And, you know, I had this conversation on Soul Brothers podcast as well. Uh, we are imprinted when we are born. And those imprints, imprints like you have uh, said, they give you certain characteristics that make you better at certain things than other people. Yep. Uh, some people are naturally good with women. Some people are naturally good can uh, persuading people some people are really good at math and I think that one of the most important things in life for uh, true happiness and success is leaning into who you are at your core and everybody is born um, with some type of imprint and I think and and I think you know I always like to say be yourself is the best advice that you will ever get but be the best version of yourself yep. that is the difference and I think that's a lot of a lot of people don't um, understand that and I think everyone's life is unique that's why I try not to judge people unless I'm walking in their shoes uh, unless you really give me a reason to judge you I try not to ever do that um, I think everyone has their own their own destiny and their own uh, uh, what do you want to call it but I, I don't believe uh, that I, I don't believe you could ever find true happiness uh, unless you live within your essence and you see it a lot of times with people who spent their whole life say for example uh, trying to become super rich and super successful, and then they get there and they're miserable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this in my career. Like guys yeah. you think would have it all were just absolutely miserable. And I could probably tell you one of the reasons is that they're not doing what they were put here to do. Yeah. And I think that is so critically important. And I think we lose sight of it in today's world because uh, we're so worried about, you know, everything's so expensive and, and you have to be successful, this, that, and the third. And there's such high demand. Uh, to be a person of um, of high character and uh, success and things of that nature. So I think people are, are always constantly chasing something because they have to live up to a certain thing and they want to fit in society and they want to get certain, uh, they want to hang out with a certain group that they lose track of what really makes them happy. And, um, you know, I said, it, I put out in a tweet today, uh, don't find out on your deathbed that uh, you weren't doing the thing that you, that would have really made you happy in life, if you know what I'm saying. 
For sure, for sure, yeah. And it's too short not to. You know, we don't, like, <laughs> we could die tomorrow, right? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, things can happen. Things do happen all the time that are very mm-hmm. unexpected. And bada boom, bada bing. Um, if you're not everyone doing, thinks they're gonna be. Um, yeah, everyone thinks everyone they're gonna th- live to hundred plus. You know, like yeah, they all. Everyone thinks they're gonna die uh, old, uh, yeah, an old yeah. man or an old woman. It doesn't that's always just work not that the way. Reality, yeah. yeah. So yes. no, that's a really good point, and um, I I agree. I've been reading uh, Robert Greene's Mastery, and he talks a lot about you know going to your childhood, going to those origins, uh, because that's usually the telltale indicator of you know, what those gifts were, like what you were naturally kind of drawn to as, as a kid in some way, obviously that evolves as you go to an adult, you know, like for example, if, if you're a master at sales, I mean, you're not necessarily selling when you're three years old, but you, but you can persuade your, you know, your parents to get you certain things. You can persuade people to, to do certain things for you. And then that would kind of indicate more of that wiring, more of that knack. And other people are more artists. Other people are more, uh, pattern recognition and, and mathematics and that sort of thing. So I think that's a really important point for those listening. You know, if you guys are trying to figure out um, how to tap into that aspect of yourself, you really do have to look at, you know, what were some of the things that you really, really enjoyed doing as a child? And not just like the the basic things that everyone does, but the kind of unique, almost weird things that that you just did. Some of the weird um, traits and characteristics that that you had and also some of the activities and ideas uh, that you were drawn to. Because that's an indicator of what, like all of this comes out to bring it back to energy. All of this comes down to doing things and investing your time um, and awareness on things that bring you energy, as opposed to things that take energy from you. And your passion, your 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 what you should be doing, your mission, your dharma, all of that it revolves around bringing you more energy, because those gifts are basically like vessels. You are a vessel for those gifts, and if they were draining you, you wouldn't be able to share them with the world. Right. So so when you're super passionate about something, you feel that passion like surging through you in all ways then you know, that's an absolute indicator that you're very, very either completely in alignment or almost completely in alignment with what you should be doing. So passion is a good indicator of that. Absolutely. And, um, you know, what you said is you have to find out what makes you you and lean into it. That is where everything gets really interesting and things will start moving and you'll notice like you'll notice like when you find this things just start coming into your life dude when you're on the right path like things synchronicity just goes through the freaking roof uh the right people will come into your life the right information will come into your life and that's when you know that uh you are on the uh correct path and the only way you get on that correct path is uh like you said is leaning into what makes you you and, you know, some people are like, well, I don't like me. I'm weird or whatever the case is. You're not weird. You're just undeveloped, yep. uh, in my opinion. You know, we all have a certain development that we have to go through uh, before we become, you know, before we hit a certain level of uh, respectability. No one's born. You know, well, some people are. But, uh, you know, no one's born perfect or uh, already on point in every aspect. But you need to um, lean into what makes you you if you're like bro i'm 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 an eccentric person you know i've always uh went my own way in life i've always um had my own opinions i uh i never ever um really like to go along with the uh, norms of society and i lean into that I, i'm proud of it you know what i'm saying has it uh has it always went the right way absolutely not you know what I'm saying? But, it never does. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, but, you know, I lean into my eccentricity. And I think that um, now by saying that doesn't mean I'm weird. I'm one of the, you know, if you met me, you'd be like, oh, this kid's completely, uh, you know. But my point is, um, you know, I'm me. I'm un- unapologetically me. And, you know, I said something uh, a few weeks ago. I think it was on short. I don't know. But I wouldn't trade places with anybody. Mm-hmm. And the That's reason I you know that, that you're doing what you should be doing. Yes, I'm here for a specific reason. I, at least I believe that. Whether that's true or not is, is uh, irrelevant because it's what I believe. And I wouldn't trade places with anyone. Now, is that saying that I have the best life in the world? Absolutely not. But it's saying that I have a specific mission, a uh, specific life path, a specific destiny that I'm here to fulfill. And if you don't look at your life that way, you're completely doing it wrong. If you look at someone on social media or in your life and say, I wish I was that guy, you're a loser. You are an absolute loser, and I and I don't say that in um, 
in a sense that I'm insulting you. I'm saying that in a sense that you don't understand yet, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just to bring it back to, to money and finance, um, because this is where um, we're talking about passion. We're talking about following yep. your purpose and your mission and stuff. And, you know, some people will say, um, well, I need to make money. I need to survive. I need to support my family. All this, you know, stuff. Um, what do you kind of say to those those types of people who, you know, obviously money is important. No one's denying that. Yeah, no. and, and we need to, you know, not be in survival. That's very important because oh, otherwise you your passion gets distorted, mm -hmm. you know. You have the Maslow hierarchy needs for a reason. You have to um, build your foundation first before you. So it's tricky, right? Because, you know, mindset and psychology and spirituality, like those are kind of considered luxuries to people in society. Yep. But you need to try to figure out how to instill them early on because they will help you the move up that better, ladder sure. of needs. And, you know, some people say, well, I can't focus on that right now because I'm worried about paying my bills. And I absolutely understand that. Uh, you know, you can't be homeless and uh, trying to figure out the secrets of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to start little by little. Like I said, when I first got into the mindset, uh, you know, persuasion, you start with the small things. You start with goal setting. You start with uh, visualization. People don't realize how powerful uh, just visualization alone persistently mm -hmm. while also um, doing the work. Uh, that is one of the most powerful things you could possibly do. I have healed myself from ailments using visualization. I have made my goals come quicker uh, using visualization. But here's the thing. Uh, this is where the manifesting uh, secret crowd gets it wrong. You can't manifest things into your life um, without a tremendous... Like, let's just say you are wishing for $10 million, right? But you don't have the vessels to deliver $10 million. You're going to cause a disaster if you're successful, right? But... You know, so the mistake that people make in this game with this whole, uh, you know, it's not woo-woo. This stuff works, dude. Like, I, I have I have done it more than enough times mm -hmm. to sometimes very terrifying results yeah. um, to know that it works. But if you don't have the vessels in place, and what I mean by vessels, if you don't have the um, infrastructure in place to receive the blessings, it's not going to work, or it's going to work out in a very bad way. So, yes, you have to worry about, you know, your foundation, you have to build yourself up, right? But at the same time, you know, you also, you, you can't ignore the inner game because the inner game is like, even with the guys just starting out in my business, the first thing we taught them was the inner game. Now, I'm not saying that inner game was, was terribly advanced, but we had to change their mindset before anything else changed, right? Absolutely. Because that is the programming. Like if we're, let's just pretend we're an empty vessel, even though we're not, let's just pretend we're an empty vessel. Uh, when you get a new guy in my business or whatever business, really, when you're training someone, uh, you want that person to forget everything they ever knew and you want to program them with the proper programming to become successful. And I don't like to use the word programming because I believe ultimately you should have no programs, but in the beginning they are essential. And um, because society has has downloaded so many programs that we don't even know we downloaded, uh, that have been put in our hard drive without our, without our permission, without our understanding. And we have put these beliefs and uh, whatever you want to call them, and we play them out in our lives. And then you ask yourself, where, how did I believe that? Why do I do this? And then you start really digging deep and you realize that none of this stuff was really anything you wanted to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. You were just told by society to do that. And I think that's uh, very important. Uh, so, like, say, for example, we're training somebody in new in sales. We need to remove all of that, all those uh, negative programs that they have, and we need to replace them uh, with powerful programs that are going to make them great salesmen. Or uh, with trading, uh, for example, we need to redefine how people look at risk and how they look at the markets. You know, most people go into the markets, and, you know, this is uh, something that's very difficult to do even to this day for me, but pe most people go into the market and they're looking at how much money they can make uh, the professionals are evaluating constantly how much money they can lose. Uh, that's the difference between a professional and an amateur and someone who loses money. The big guys, uh, they're constantly focused on preservation. They know that if they just stay in the game and have um, a halfway decent IQ level and they manage their risk, they're going to make money. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, that little tweak in mindset is what makes all the difference. Like one person is focused on, oh, what can I take from the market instead of, hey, what can I preserve? 
And then, you know, for from the sales aspect, uh, you know, you just have to get people to drop their limiting beliefs because most most things we are taught are complete bullshit. Yep. And, you know, we're always told that, uh, you know, just settle for this, just get a regular job. And, um, you know, some of our biggest enemies could be the people that love us the most. That's the problem. And, um, you know, they mean well. They just want to see you do good and, and all that stuff. But usually that'll happen in life where you're, you know, the, the people who try to keep you down the most are the ones who actually love you the most. Absolutely. And it's a very difficult situation to be in, but you just have to learn to uh, balance that some form. But, yeah, it all comes down to programs at the end of the day. It really does. And so, like, to say that you could you, you can't ignore, uh, again, there's levels to this, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't worry about the secrets of the world before you can't pay your rent. But at the same time, if you don't have proper mindset, you're never going to be able to pay your rent. You get what I'm saying? So there's, like, a balance. For sure. And you have to, that's why there's a degree system in esoteric orders, right? You got to start with the first degree before you get to the 33rd degree. You don't just start at the 33rd degree. You have to start as a neophyte, uh, then you move up the degree system. Same thing in life, you know, you have to know what, uh, you have to know where you are in the game and uh, know what is needed at this part of the game to get you to the next level. Exactly. And it's funny because, uh, I mean, the, the people that are most resistant to, the inner work and the inner game and the mindset and that sort of stuff shifting beliefs um the thing is this stuff is free you know like all it takes is you closing your eyes at, like you could be living in a crack den it doesn't matter you can close your eyes and you can see yourself somewhere else you know you can close your eyes and you can start thinking about how you think about money how you think about yourself right what types of what types of attitudes you have towards the world you can start to do the thinking at zero cost at all, you know? So it's one of the cheapest things that you can do with the highest ROI because when you actually do it, the biggest amount of change and transformations uh, can occur. What are some of the what are some of the positive and maybe negative beliefs that, that you got after, um, you know, spending that time on Wall Street? And, and especially because that was pretty, you know, you're pretty young at that time um, and into yeah. adulthood. So, so you're asking me what is the positive and the negative? Yeah. All right, like what so are some of those like beliefs start. and core beliefs that you got conditioned okay, so, with during that? Well, the positive was the people I met. I mean, yeah. I, I can't tell you. I, I have yet, whether it's online, offline, I have yet to meet more impressive people than I have in the business. And when I'm not trying to exaggerate what I did, like these people were larger than life. Uh, they had uh, innate ability to be leaders and to motivate people. Uh, you know, getting out of meeting out of a meeting with some of these guys, you were ready to just take over the world. Like I used yep. to work from seven in the morning to ten at night every single day, and you know the mind. And I'm constantly working too. I'm talking dialing the phone the entire time, and you know, the mindset that you need to instill in people to do that is uh, is is pretty damn impressive. Like you need to change people's paradigms of what they are doing with their lives and what they're trying to do with their lives because they are sacrificing so much of their life and keep in mind i did this on a 200 dollars salary sometimes no salary and it wasn't so just easy. Commission? It's strictly commission yeah and you know i think they gave you like 200 bucks for like six weeks and, you know, so when people try to complain to me, oh, it's too hard, just that, you know, I would, uh, I don't pay attention to any of that stuff because, um, you know, in today's world, you can make money so much easier. And, you know, with the internet and all that stuff and all types of access to technology that we have. So, uh, you know, to this day, uh, online or off, I haven't met anyone that even comes close uh, to the impressiveness of uh, some of the people I have met uh, through the business. They're just larger than light people. Um, I almost think that they are they don't exist um, as much anymore because it was a certain time period yeah. and there was a certain mentality uh, in the 80s and 90s that that developed a certain type of person. Um, you know, you're young, so you don't really remember the, um, the 90s. Uh, the 90s, everyone's hustling, bro. Everyone was hustling. Everyone was all about... Uh, it, was, it, it, was, uh, it was just an interesting time, man. It was... Uh, I, I can't describe it, but the animal spirits were alive and well, put it that way. And there was nothing but blinding optimism about the future. And, you know, if we could replicate them, that again, that would be amazing. Now, as far as negatives go, uh, the fast life and uh, just being around a lot of people that, um, you know, when you have people that that live like that and, and 
do do extreme things. They also have extreme habits and extreme lifestyles. And uh, that was definitely the uh, negative part. Uh, that definitely cost me a lot of money and caused me a lot of pain. And, uh, you know, I'm honest about it with everyone I speak to about it with. But, yeah, it was, it's, uh, it was like a double-edged sword because, uh, you know, it, the, that business is exactly the way they portray it in the movies. Yeah. Like it's Wall crazy Street. like that, yeah. Gordon like, Gekko. when I watch Wolf of Wall Street, I was like, all right, cool, you know? Like, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so that was definitely the negative. But the positive still outweighs it be, by so much because it teaches you that type of high-intensity, um, highly competitive business mm -hmm. teaches you mindset that lasts your lifetime. But what are some of those beliefs that you still hold with you from that? Just, uh, you have to have... Um, Never fear no man, number one. Like, you yeah. never, ever, ever fear any man. You need to put yourself on equal footing with every man you speak to, and you should believe that firmly. Uh, you should never be walking into a room, no matter what your situation, I don't care if you have a dollar in your pocket, you should never be walking. Now, that doesn't mean be disrespectful. Uh, that doesn't mean don't add value. Like, don't go to something, an event, where you're not going to add value to somebody and you're just trying to be a stair climber, right? But, like, make yourself valuable. But that's not my point, what I'm trying to say, is you need to feel like whether you have $10 million in your bank account or whether you have $1.50 uh, in your bank account that you could stand ground with anyone. And, you know, those are those are beliefs that were instilled with me because think about what we were doing. We were 19, 20, 22, 23-year-old uh, kids, basically, calling up high-powered attorneys, calling up CEOs of multi-billion dollar corporations. So that's the mindset, uh, you know, people who own sports teams. These are the people we were calling. And um, if you come across them like a little B, they're not going to take you seriously. And they're, not, they're just going to hang up on you, even though a lot of them just hang, ended up hanging up on you anyway. You get my point, though. Uh, so, you know, I learned that, number one, that you, can, you, you have to feel that you could stand with any man and you're on equal footing. Uh, number two, uh, to have expansive paradigms, to believe anything is possible. Uh, to understand the power of uh, persuasion and words that you could literally move nations, as you know. Um, we've seen this plenty of times throughout history. Uh, the pen and the uh, words are always mightier than the sword. Uh, because to get to that point where we're using the sword and the guns, we have to have people to inspire us to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is done by, uh, by inciting people's emotions uh, not not their not their logic, their emotions. People are always driven by their emotions. When you look at politics these days, what are they trying to do? They're trying to they're trying to grab your emotions. They're not trying to speak to you logically. Nothing makes sense. Uh, so they have a, you know, they have a group of people. Whether it's forty percent, thirty percent, doesn't matter. Uh, we saw this with the um, BLM thing in uh, May of 2021 that lasted to the end of the year. They incited people on emotion. And the whole COVID thing was inciting people on emotion. So, you know, words are extremely powerful. We can move nations with them. We could destroy nations with them. And I also learned that um, that you uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, that that's the uh, foundation that was instilled in me, that to, uh, to always, and, and not just to feel like you're on equal footing with any man, but to build yourself up to where you feel that way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about emotional and mental control in this day and age on that note too um because that's you know that's a superpower in this day and age is to be able to control your own mind and how you think and also to be able to control your emotions and your reactions and your impulses um obviously you know we can look at the world nowadays and just see how driven it is by negative programming and by emotional impulses and reactions but i want to kind of T touch on this in a more constructive way and um, talk about how this can be used specifically you know for entrepreneurs and for people in business and sales um, and maybe even trading too like how how emotional control and uh, mental control can basically ensure your success because once you have those down pat I mean you need you know. to observe from above and um, think before you react I mean, a lot of, uh, and I'm not saying I mastered this in any way. It's something I try to do. But, like, we go through the day and we do things without thinking about them. And we think they're natural things, but sometimes they're not. And we have certain reactions and certain habits that if we maybe put a camera on us all day, we'd be like, wow, why am I doing that? And I think that most of that stuff can 
be worked with by, I like to say, to look at yourself in third person, like to realize that we are not our thoughts, we are not of our emotions, and to actually think about what, how we're going to react to something. Uh, you know, I, I've developed the habit. I'm a very um, emotional person. I, ha I, I was a very, uh, I still am, but you know what I'm saying. I've learned to control it over the years. I'm hyper emotional. Like I am someone who lives in extremes. I don't have a middle ground usually. I'm, I've been working on that. Food, uh, you know, it took me a little while in life to actually get to the level where I'm working at it. But I'm, a, I'm an extreme person, and I've always went either a thousand percent or zero percent. I didn't know what middle was, if you know what I'm saying. And that carried over to every aspect of my life, um, whether it be with, um, you know, the way I do business, how I handle relationships. And uh, things like that. I was always all in or all out. There was no, uh, I'm either love you, hate you, or I'm indifferent. You get it? Yeah. So uh, that's one thing I've had to work with. And I realized that, uh, you know, you're not your thoughts. You have to learn to observe. You're not always your thoughts. You need to observe what's going on in your mind. I think you would be really surprised. Like when you first start meditating and you say to yourself, where did that thought come from? Mm -hmm. And I think people don't realize that a lot of the stuff, that comes into our brain is being attracted by the frequency we're giving off. I think that is, uh, you know, there's some people that talk about this, so I'm not the one who came up with this. But, you know, it's a Gnostic teaching as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, a lot of guys talk about, like, you basically attract the thoughts of the frequency that you're sending out. So if you're a negative SOB uh, who's suicidal and all that stuff, you're going to attract other bad thoughts. And not only that... Uh, if you actually put yourself out into the world, you're going to attract other bad people um, that are on the same wavelength as you. It goes back to what we were saying earlier in the conversation. Uh, we're all just information and energy. And I think if people would look at life that way, I think it would actually work out better for them because they could ask themselves, what type of information do I want? What type of energy and information do I want to attract in my life? What type, what type of people uh, do I want to surround myself with? What type of uh, significant other do I want to bring into my life because uh, you need to match their information. And if you don't, you're not going to get that. You're going to get exactly what you are in life. And, uh, you know, that's the cold, hard truth that nobody likes to um, yep. uh, to acknowledge you sometimes. You get what you want. You get what you are. Yep. Everything around you is a result of your past decisions. It's just as simple as that. Uh, I was never the type to blame anybody for anything. I've always knew that everything was always my fault. Uh, and I think that a lot of people uh, would do very well to know that. But it all comes down to emotional control, like actually observing yourself. Uh, you know, Gertie Jeff, I'm reading one of his books right now, one of the ones you recommended, actually. And uh, The Fourth Way, and he talks yeah. about how we are a multiplicity of eyes. Like we're not just, like we have our emotional center, we have our instinctual center, we have our intellectual center. And most of the time, they're all in conflict with each other. And, you know, it's really interesting because I never, uh, not that I never thought about it, but I've always looked at the I as a single entity. And now I'm realizing it's not a single entity. Your job is to centralize them into a uh, single entity. Yeah, exactly. Because that's, that's what, uh, what, however, whatever term people want to use, but that's essentially what, you know, that I am presence or that true awareness is. It's yep. all of but, those aspects of your being that mm -hmm. absorb and receive and stay transmit information like your emotional body your mental body your brain uh your physical body your spiritual body all that when all that's in sync and calm down and in your control that's real awareness and you know it when you feel like you feel it like you know you know the difference between when things are out of order and things are in conflict with one another because you feel tension you feel physical tension you feel uh, emotional tension or you feel emotionally down and drained or you feel mentally exhausted, um, spiritually exhausted, whatever, when any sort of aspect within you is exhausted or tense or stressed, etc., then you know that there's some inner conflict going on. And uh, and that's why awareness work is so important too, you know, yep. cultivating a greater and greater awareness. More yeah, you know, you more. said something about the uh, I am. I was always under the impression that the I was a single higher aspect of yourself. But it's really not. It is, um, like you said, it's a multiplicity of different... It's a totality entity. at the end of the day, right? It's a totality of, of the all that is. I mean, that is what I am is. Yeah, yeah, but most people think it's a, a singular entity. Yeah. 
It's yeah. not. And it, it might be, I don't know exactly how many it is, but I know it's more than a few. And the goal, it's like when you want to do something, right? Okay, I'm going to do this. And then you start procrastinating and don't do it. Well, that's because your eyes are not integrated. They're separate. You get it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so like you're exactly. procrastinating, so and you it, want... And the truth, the supreme truth, though, is that it, it is a single entity, but there's... It's like it's like saying, you know, your body's a single entity, but you have a hand, you have an arm, you have a leg, you have a head, you know, you have organs, you have all these aspects of them that can be in conflict with each other. You know, if your head's going like this and you're trying to move over here, that's just not going to work. So, yeah. for sure, and you have like to, the one um... contained within the all. Yep. And the biggest challenge, like you were talking about emotional control, the biggest challenge is um, number one, awareness. And number two, just uh, integration. And it is, it is not easy. And anyone who wants to try to tell you it easy is lying to you. Uh, it takes a lot, a lot of work. And I think, you know, maybe very few people will actually get to the point in their life where they actually fully uh, integrate uh, all of their centers together. But, you know, the, the first part of the work is uh, just being aware of it. And um, like you said, emotional control. How do you have emotional control? You can only have emotional control when you stop yourself from having instinctual reactions. And how do you stop yeah. that? By being aware. Uh, if someone makes you mad, when you're about to lash out, you got to catch yourself. And you got to say, no, I'm not going to get mad at this. And that's the beginning of self-mastery in a way, if you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um I want to talk a little bit about discipline too and how that all ties in to kind of just continue on this point because discipline is another really important factor that I mean that's what creates uh, that sense of control right and uh, I remember you were talking about this a little while ago when you said I think you quit smoking are you still yep. on that yeah no phase? I'm 100% off and I'll let you finish nice. your thought and I'll tell you about that yeah so uh, discipline is really important and, and part of discipline is is challenging yourself in various ways to ensure that you have control and that's always something that i always did uh, even when i was using like i don't use substances now but when i was using a lot of substances um in my kind of rock and roll punk rock kind of era in my mm -hmm. early 20s uh that even then i would have instances where i would just take breaks because i always wanted to ensure that i was in control yep and made sure that I was always in control because I saw uh, family members, I saw friends, I saw people in my life that got out of control and that was terrifying to me. Um, obviously, I still wanted to enjoy myself and still wanted to kind of go a little crazy um, to each their own. But for me, it was always like the importance of discipline in my life was always to ensure that I'm in control and uh, like having a daily practice of any sort, whether it's a morning routine or a meditation practice or yogic practice or uh, any sort of ritual that you integrate into your life is super important because that is setting you up for the rest of the day to ensure that, hey, if you can start your day in control, the likelihood that you're going to finish your day still in control is a lot higher than if you start your day and all of a sudden you have all these racing thoughts and you just get out of bed and you're just kind of following those impulses. Yep. And... Most people live unconsciously. Exactly. Yep. And as far as what you were saying about cigarettes, I... Um... So when I got sick, I got sick for like the first time in like forever, but I got sick and I realized I was like, I don't need cigarettes. I was like, I haven't smoked in four days. I was like, why do I do this? And I was smoking a pack a day. And then I realized, I said, I'm not addicted to the nicotine. I'm addicted to the ritual. And so just to prove to myself that I was in charge, I, I recognized I broke down the ritual to exactly why and when I was smoking cigarettes. And it was the easiest thing in the world for me to quit. Now, with that being said, I have lost control in my life a few times. And, you know, I'm actually thankful uh, that I went there uh, because, it, number one, it's made me who I am today. Like being able to uh, crawl out of the darkness into the light is, uh, you know, I don't recommend the experience to anyone, but it teaches you so much. And what I'm trying, so when you, when you see both sides of what that looks like, uh, you're able to identify how it gets there. And, and I could say that the, the, the most important thing is just you have to have awareness. And, um, you know, it sounds so simple, right? Like have awareness of, oh, well, I'm aware. I know what I'm doing. No, you don't, bro. I mean, do you really, if your life isn't exactly, I'm not saying it has to be exactly the way you want it. But uh, if you have, you know, we're all, we're all creatures of habit and impulses. Like people who go on social media and you're scrolling for social media and you get mad at something on social media. That's a sign that you're not emotionally in control. Um, I used to lash out sometimes when I when I went through Twitter, and now I don't. Nothing draws a reaction out of me no more. 
Like that doesn't mean I won't respond to something that I disagree with or something, but you, you it, it is so hard. It's a different now. energy. Yeah, you, it is so hard now to to get me upset. It's almost impossible. Like you, like I used to get all upset about what was going on in the world and politics and all that stuff. Now it's virtually impossible. I realize that my control is limited, and all I really can control is uh, what is going around me, uh, what's going on in my life. And uh, I know if I do what I'm supposed to do, and I influence the people closest to me to do what they're supposed to do, then at least my immediate world will get better. I can't worry about the macro picture anymore. If you know what I'm saying? And I used to be one of those people that wanted to save the world. And I still do, in a way. But I realize my limitations, if you know what I'm saying. For sure. For sure. Um, and that kind of gets into this idea, too, of, um, you know, fate versus... I mean, a lot of people see the dichotomy as it's fate versus free will. But I, I see it a little differently. I see it as, you know, we have, we have the path of fate, which is just the path of uh, drifting. You know, basically drifting through life, walking the path of just basically allowing the outer circumstances in the outer world to dictate uh, how we act and where we go and what we do. And then we have destiny, which is something a lot higher than that. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a calling yep. and it's something that you need to answer the call towards. Um, otherwise you're going to just maintain that, that path of, of which is fate. And you're just going to continue to do the same things over and over again. Um, expecting different results, which you know we call insanity. Yeah, that's an interesting point you made. Uh, destiny and what was the other thing? Fate. Fate. Yeah. Yeah. So destiny, like you said, is a much higher thing. Like destiny is you. <sighs> it's such a. It's such a. Uh, it's such an interesting topic because I had this conversation with somebody else and they were like, you know, I was like, uh, well, what if you intentionally make a change? And he was like, well, that's baked into the cake too. And I'm like, hmm, you know what I'm saying? And, yep. you know, so I, I, I struggle with the idea that, like, let's just say we did a total 180 in life. Was that baked into the cake, too? Do you get what I'm saying? Yep. So it, it's really an interesting conversation. It's one we'll never know. So we probably shouldn't spend any, you know, too much time trying to think about it. But, yeah, I think destiny, we all come here with a destiny. But. It's not guaranteed that you live that destiny. It is your job to put yourself in that destiny. Yep. And I think that's the difference between drifting and fulfilling a destiny that uh, you were put here, which is kind of predetermined as well. But it, I, I don't believe destiny is um, necessarily guaranteed, if you know what I'm saying. No, I agree. And I don't think, uh, I certainly don't think everyone will achieve their destiny. And um, also, I mean, studying kind of the yogic sciences and how the the yogic philosophy on that is that some people just don't have a destiny because their entire job here is to live out some of their karma and get over that possible um, yeah now you know but that would be the destiny or, yeah exactly exactly yeah. so then then it becomes this inter interweaving loop you know yep. um but i the, the way that i i always saw it was just you know we have free will exists within the realm of fate you know, yep, so it's exactly. Like this. That's my thought as well. Because it's all perfect, right? There's no imperfections. Everything in this, you know, grand experiment, whatever it is, is perfect. You know, it's all contained within the bubble of infinity, meaning all potentials exist. So some point at some point in my life, I'm going to do exactly what I was going to do anyways. You know? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I had this uh, girl, she's a younger, a younger woman, and she was like, uh, she gave me a really... Um, good analogy for what she thought and she was like free will up the mountain but the destination remains the same and i don't know if i necessarily believe with it but i could uh i could vibe with that if you know what i'm saying yeah yeah i mean i just yeah i just see it as it's like it's all contained within the one right the the whole world like the whole whatever we want to call this the womb of the cosmos or mm -hmm. divinity or the universe or the multiverse or however um and then you know we the if i mean ultimately free will is a joke because we are all one right like which means that the initial thought and the initial impulse of what we wanted to do was already created cuz i don't believe that we're like i don't believe that anyone's creating anything i don't believe that we're creating anything everything's already been created and we are essentially aligning with creation and different aspects and various so like aspects teleology, for example is that what you're getting at yeah like, like we're all uh, basically in the state parallel, of something parallel that was already universes What's that? 
the whole idea of like string theory in parallel universes like we're we're basically every moment is its own like there's only the moment and every moment is this it's it's like a it's like those old picture movies or the uh stop motion animations right where we where it looks like a moving picture but realistically it's just frame 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 and those frames are perfect those frames are predetermined those frames are individual frames but we see them as not individual universes because everything's moving so fast we see it as just this is my life and this is how i'm working this is how i'm operating and uh and we're just walking through it and not thinking yeah you know it, it. uh it's, it brings me to the idea of uh certain people who are like destined to be in your life mm-hmm. and you know we all maybe maybe not all of us but we you know we all have heard of someone who has someone in their life that is there with the most ridiculous circumstances and you have a ridiculous connection to that person to the point of it almost being psychic yep. and like everything just seems like a um like an impossibility that you're even uh connected to that person in whatever way yep. but uh so things like that really make me wonder especially when everything else is on point like it's just like uh, like say for example it's a significant other and then, like all your astrology and everything is just like perfect and you're just like, all right, is this just like uh, the cosmic threads of destiny? Is that what this is? Or am I just being, uh, you know, maybe I'm just having like, um, maybe you're just in love or maybe you're just imagining things. But some things, and it doesn't just have to be with a woman. It could be with a friend. It could just be with an event that happened in life. Like people that come into your life. Like I have about three or four people that came into my life that I only met once. And they have a significant, and some of these interactions were only like 20, 30, 40 seconds. And I still remember them to this day. And they have influenced my life to this day. And so when you think about things like that, uh, and, and you know that feeling you get when you feel like you feel like something like that? Yep. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, oh, yeah. Like you just feel like that situation was supposed to happen. And, bro, like I'll never forget those things. There's only like four or five of them in my life, but it goes into the idea of uh, whether you, you know, some people like to call them angels, some people like, I just, I don't know, man, like certain things are just unexplainable. Uh, like, for example, as I got more um, into my spiritual path, books would drop at the perfect time. Mm-hmm. Like I would go in a certain place and get a place that I really go to and get an answer to a question that's been bothering me forever. Uh, certain people will come into your life. Uh, you'll just get signs that it's the right thing to do. Or, or even crazier, you'll get spiritual experiences that happen in the astral or whatever but uh my point is that these things happen and then and then they show us that there is uh there is something guiding this all uh and you know there's the you know what the l field is the what an l field an l field like the reason why our body is able to do what it does with no um uh, with no um, like guidance, like our heartbeats and our cells do what they have mm-hmm. to do. It's something called the L field. You might want to look into it. And what it is, it's like a guiding energy uh, that that um, that pretty much is the organizing force of uh, our particular reality. It's called the L field. Look it up. You'll be really interested. It depends on who you're learning about it from. Like yeah. certain people word it differently. Yeah, I mean, I've heard it worded very differently, but that I understand the concept. Yeah, so the concept is that this particular intelligence that is all around us is why we are able to walk around and our bodies function perfectly without us having to do anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep. It's like a, a guiding intelligence, so to say. And so when you put these things all together, it really, it really brings up more questions than get answers for sure. You know, and, and that's where it goes back to the beginning of this conversation, like money is energy and everything is energy. And I think th- I think people really should take that into account in their lives because, uh, you know, how do I change my life? I need to realign. I need to align the energy to the life that I want. Uh, you know, like we talk, I know me and you speak about this, the fake it till you make it thing. You know, that is not the way you don't fake it. You align. There's a exactly. huge, huge difference. Yeah, you become uh, it. Yeah. You have to become it. Yeah, you have to not even become it. You have to be in the process of becoming it. And, um, yeah, like you said, it's an alignment. It's not a faking. Uh, People who fake are very obvious, and you can see right through them. People who are aligned, it comes across much more. It comes across completely genuine, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the thing, and this is where kind of people, there's like a a lot of nuance with that, right? Like, because I understand the idea behind, you know, faking it until you make it. Because if you don't have, um, like what we talked about earlier with the, with the, the 
the energy and, and the identity, right? It's like if you have the identity and you genuinely believe it, that's the key. That's the key principle here with yeah. the whole fake it to make it, right? It's the genuine belief and the knowingness versus the uh, you, you feel like a fraud and you feel like a like a like a you know jabroni because you know that this is not who you really are and you you feel like you're wearing a mask. Yeah, absolutely. But that's like not the, it. that's becoming it in my exactly opinion. exactly yeah. and i i agree and that's the difference um when we're like earlier when we were saying you know uh, you, you said that uh you, it doesn't matter if you have a dollar in your bank account or a 10 million dollars in your bank account you know you have to approach people from the same level of confidence as if you did have that regardless mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that's the process of becoming that's the it because at the end of the day it's all energy mm -hmm. which means that you get to select what type of energy you want to you know embody and Obviously, there's you have your conditioned energy, the energy that you're already emitting, that needs to be you know, basically transmuted or transformed into the energy that you want to embody. Uh, but that's the process, right? At the end of the day, if you want to create positive momentum in, in your life, the way that I kind of describe it uh, to people is you either have a like someone who's a really, in a really dark place, right? They basically they just have are, are a mass of negative energy that is just sucking in more and more it's like a feedback loop right it's just you're just sucking in more and more of those experiences and it makes it very very difficult to get out of that state but when you start to start building up that uh, a more positive ball of energy when you start to build up a, a positive state of mind of body of spirit and you start surrounding yourself with positive people you start inserting positivity into your into your life then all of a sudden that that ball of positive energy starts getting larger and larger and larger to the point and it takes time it does People take time for part. sure for sure because yeah. it's it's energy you're, we're not trying i mean it, it it takes time but it doesn't really it's not actually time that that it takes it takes uh it takes that it, it has to reach that tipping point point. and sometimes i've seen cases where sometimes that tipping point can happen very very quickly and mm -hmm. other times because you've been going down this path for so long it's going to be a while before you dig yourself yeah, it's out. like you're not going to lose 100 pounds overnight right you're not going to exactly. become ripped overnight like if yeah. you let your body get out of um out of form, it's going to take you a good solid year of hard work to get ripped, you know, depending on how uh, uh, how much you've let yourself get out of shape, for example. Um, so as to what you're saying, you know, yes, sometimes the momentum switch can be quick, but usually I think where most people get discouraged and say all this stuff is bullshit is because they don't have, they, it's a constant work in the beginning, especially if you put yourself down a road um where you really went off on the deep end man that's yeah. gonna take a while to uh to transform like that doesn't happen overnight it could take years uh in some cases and and you know it, it it's a slow gradual it could be quick but for the most part it's a gradual process but all of a sudden out of nowhere you start picking up momentum exactly it's just and like then soon interest. what's that it's like compounding interest yeah, and then all of a sudden, before you know it, all that hard work you were putting in it didn't seem like it was working. Then, boom, all these people start coming together. All these things start coming together because you stayed on it and you had a vision and you stayed on it and you stayed persistent. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everything starts coming together. Most success is very quick. Uh, it may not. What I mean by quick is um, when it happens, it happens. Yeah. It takes a long time to get there. But usually when it happens, it happens fast, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I always say that to my clients, like, because uh, they'll call me, like, how long is it going to take to, you know, start thinking differently and experiencing the results? And it's like, well, if you spend the last 10, 20, 30 years with these beliefs and these ideas in your life, you built up so much momentum and validation. And there's so many other aspects of your life that validate those beliefs. I mean, that's literally how you've designed your life. So when you start to rewire those beliefs, when you start to change those ideas in your mind and those programs, um, a lot of other things are going to happen. I mean, it, it, it gets worse before it gets better usually yep. yes, because there's so much going on. And that's the thing, what you just said right there. And that's why most people uh, get discouraged and quit because it does uh, get much worse uh, sometimes before it gets better because you kind of like if you haven't hit rock bottom yet Don't forget like rock bottom doesn't mean you're going no. Yeah, you might go nowhere, but up but sometimes sideways is uh, uh, Sideways is a, a tough just as tough as rock bottom even yeah. if you're slightly moving up And you know, I think the most important thing when you're trying to turn around your life The very first thing you have to do is get yourself in physical good shape uh, I can't 
like that is the very first thing that I would tell someone uh, to work on because it has a natural progression uh, because it builds discipline. Um, you start seeing results. You understand that gradual, persistent effort yields results. Yep. And you start, and then as you, you know, not everybody, but if you are a uh, aware, somewhat intelligent person and you get into working out, eventually you're going to get into mindset. Mm -hmm. And then mindset will take into take you into spirituality. It's sort of like when you're, um, it's sort of like, uh, like if you're doing a degree system, if you're doing like some type of esoteric order, right? They start with earth. Uh, you move to, uh, what, well, you know, you get what I'm saying. You have to yeah. start off with the mundane uh, before you can move into the mental, the spiritual, the emotional, you, you know, things of that nature. So uh, it's the same concept. You have to build your foundation uh, before you start messing with higher powers. And I mean that on a basic level as well. You have to start with the vessel. If yep. your vessel is not... If you're not proud of what you're walking around in, it's going to reflect number one in your in your. Um, for most people, some people are just naturally confident. But if you're not proud of how you look, and when I say proud of how you look, it doesn't mean you have to be a good-looking person. Uh, some of the most beautiful people are not very good-looking. It's just because they have such wonderful personalities and mannerisms that they they up their uh, their points by like three or four, if you know what I'm saying. Yep. And you know, personality goes such a long way. But I feel like. Uh, so looks, again, aren't necessarily, wait, 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 what was I, so what I'm trying to say is looks are not necessarily important, but you should be proud of how you look. Absolutely. And I think the most important thing is getting yourself, your body in shape, being well-groomed, uh, being clean, have nice fitting clothes. All that stuff will help you, gives you a halo effect, you know, people treat you better when you do those things. And then when you start doing all this stuff, like taking care of yourself, working out your body, getting in good shape, it starts to move to the mental. Then you start speaking better. Uh, you start carrying yourself better. You move differently. And then before you know it, um, you know, you're working on your mental. And then that is just automatically going to take you to the spiritual at some point. Usually, like I said, if you're a certain type of person, some people just aren't like that. And that's fine. But uh, if you are a certain type of thoughtful, aware person, that's going to be the natural progression. Absolutely. Um, so before we get into the hot seat and wrap this up, mm -hmm. um, what are some... What are some of the more esoteric uh, secrets that people don't really understand about the finance world and about money and how it works? So the way you have to look at the um, the markets is what I like to tell people. So I think, first of all, I think a lot of people uh, over um, complicate it. Uh, investing anyway. It's like investing is just literally being hyper aware of the world we live in and uh, being aware of trends. Uh, like, say, for example, you're out with your friends and you notice one of your uh, girlfriends has a new pocketbook. Then you go out with another group of friends and you see the same thing. You have to ask, all right, there's a trend here. Both of these girls have this expensive pocketbook. So, you know, then you ask, all right, who makes that? Um, like, you know, investing could be so very simple. Like Google, when it first came out, who knew? everyone knew that Google was going to be a successful company the minute it came out. I don't think you have ever been down on Google if you bought it from the IPO. So some things are really obvious, but I would say it's not so much esoteric what I'm going to say. It's more like common sense. And again, I go back to the anticipation of the law of causation. Uh, everything in the world is cause and effect. That's, it's just that simple. Yes, there are anomalies. Uh, yes, there are black swans. But it's really all just cause and effect. Um, so one action is done here, it's going to affect an action here. It's like when the Fed lowers interest rates, certain things are going to happen over time. When the Fed puts money into the money supply... Uh, you know, certain things are going to happen over time. And it, it's really just as simple as that. We're anticipating uh, the anticipation of the law of causation. Uh, the market is an energetic entity that is constantly measuring uh, data in real time that's coming into it. And then the other aspect of the market, it really is just uh, like crypto, for example, is uh, really just a money flow game. And uh, you need to just keep taps on where the money is flowing. I think if a lot of people... Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, investing more than trading because trading is a different animal but uh, investing is just really being hyper aware of uh, what's going on in the world and being um, you know having a, a, a forward thinking mindset uh, of being aware of what trends are going to take place like for example what I always tell people to do is for, for investing is whenever we have a long astrological cycle, like the one we're going into now is Pluto and Aquarius, like anything that's more than a few years, I tell people to look into it and read about it from like several sources. Because if you get the idea 
of what the next 20 years of uh, Pluto and Aquarius, for example, is going to bring. You understand what trends are going to come in play. Uh, for example, a funny thing, uh, right before Pluto went into Aquarius this year, AI busted upon the scene. Yep. And everyone was saying that was going to happen who were writing up these write-ups on uh, Pluto and Aquarius. And boom, we have AI busting upon the scene. Soon it's going to be a, uh, robotics. Uh, soon it's going to be AI connected to robotics. Everything, you know, I believe that we are on the cusp of um, the most innovative time period since probably the 90s, uh, you know, since the Internet hit the scene. I think we're on, um, I think the next 10, 20 years are going to drastically change the world. I believe the next 10, 20 years are going to are gonna take us to at least the next couple hundred, if you know what I'm saying. For sure. And like I said, it's really simple. It's not so much esoteric. I'll say it again. If you could just anticipate cause and effect, and have some type of risk management in place and a little bit more than that i'm oversimplifying it but anticipation of causation it really is that simple sometimes and um you know just being able to put two and two together and you know you want to let's think about what makes an asset go up right a bunch of people recognizing something you only have to get in in the beginning or middle of the recognition phase to do well in a particular investment you just don't want to be the sucker uh, who's buying it at the end after you heard, you know, after it's been running for two years and you're just hearing about it, like you're in your office after a two-year bull market and everyone's like, oh, we're buying this crypto. No, bro, that's when you sell. And, um, you know, you could always, if you're an aware person, you really shouldn't be in that situation. Yep. But, uh, you know, the idea with, with investing is simply to find to find trends, uh, not, even, not even necessarily before, everybody fine but alongside the smarter money the you know the, you want to get in along with, with the aware people if you know what i'm saying totally totally um sweet okay i'm gonna put you on the hot seat now mm -hmm. so i'm just gonna list off some words and then uh, you kind of say you know the first thing that comes to mind uh bitcoin um it's a tricky one, back because I have different opinions on this. But uh, Bitcoin, I the first word that comes to mind would be a collection of very good, various and interesting different philosophies. Uh, vegetarianism. So I have two views on this. One, uh, I think, you know, I'm an animal lover and I hate to see the way animals are treated. Mm-hmm. Um, so vegetarianism, I think it, it's extremely harmful if you do it the wrong way, but I would like to, I don't know if I'm saying this out of, um, maybe I have the wrong idea of certain things, but I do believe that, uh, animal products, especially if raised incorrectly, aren't necessarily good for you. Not animal products, but meat. But, uh, as of right now, if you had to say the first word that came to my mind, unhealthy. Islam. Structure. Uh, psychedelics. Interesting. Celibacy. Unnecessary. Modern mental health. A travesty. Meditation. Very good. Astrology. Done correctly, very good. Meme coins. Mostly unscrupulous activity. <laughs> uh, Blackrock. The devil. <laughs> uh, your life's purpose. Mine? Yep. Um, yeah, so I believe that um, just to share, and, uh, you know, in, uh, in 2019, I was inspired December of 2019 to share what I know. And, you know, I've, I've uh, taught myself a lot throughout the years, and I've uh, experienced a decent amount, so I figured I would share with the world. And I do believe that my ultimate, um, what was the uh, life purpose? My ultimate life purpose is to uh, inspire and to break conventional ideas of thinking. I like that. Um... PSYOPs. 
happening every day. The red pill. Mm, so. I'm talking more about the community, not the actual uh, red pill. No, I get it. The red pill yeah. community. I think they are men who make some good points, but cannot get over being hurt. Yeah. Uh, recession. Necessary. The Federal Reserve. Babylonian money magic. Uh, libertarianism. Unpractical. The Second Amendment. Hell yeah. Alex Jones. A player in the game. Sleepy Joe Biden. A disgusting human being. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. I, I think the guy is disgusting in all aspects. Oh my gosh, I agree. And uh, the financial markets for the next year, two years. So I believe that right now um, we may go higher than most people think. A lot of people think this is a uh, bear market rally. I um, tend to disagree. And just based on price action that we're seeing in certain certain stocks, um, I do believe that we are on the cusp, uh, due to AI and other things, on the cusp of a, uh, a transformation in technology that will absolutely change the way we do things. With that being said, I, uh, I do believe that when the Fed starts lowering interest rates, the market may come down and there may be an economic crisis ahead of us. But I can't look that far into the future right now. Um, that, is my, that is what I'm going to be paying attention to, though, when they start lowering interest rates. But for now... Uh, based on what I'm seeing, I'm, based on what I'm seeing, I think we can, will continue to go higher. Good to know. And where can people find you? Yes. So uh, as of right now, I'm just on uh, Holder of the Fire on uh, Twitter. I will eventually uh, have an email list and uh, maybe, maybe uh, expand to other platforms. Um, so you can follow me and just uh, see my random off the cuff. Uh, thoughts, which is what they are. That's all they are. And, um, you know, they're just uh, my opinions and my view on the world. Don't take them as uh, anything more than that. And, um, you know, if anyone is interested in uh, learning so learning about some of the things that we spoke about, I can be DM'd. Uh, just give me time to uh, get back to you. Uh, my specialty is uh, trading and sales. And yeah, how can they work with you? Uh, they can... Uh, how can they work with me? I offer... Um, I offer uh, basically an eight-hour uh, mentorship that usually goes over, but uh, and I I specialize uh, in sales because I have done sales my entire life. I've done uh, not only with a stockbroker, but I've done enterprise sales, and I'm still in sales to this day. And I also uh, have been trading uh, since I was 21 years old, and I have a system that uh, is very beginner-friendly that I still use to this day. And um, I have a lot of happy customers. So, uh, yeah, if anyone's interested in learning those two things and, uh, you know, things like that, just reach out. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. We'll have all the links below for everyone watching. And most important question, did you have fun? Oh, absolutely, bro. So I knew this was going to be a, a fun conversation because I know we're on the uh, same, wa uh, same wavelength with a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, that's what I love about this uh, corner of Twitter. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about uh, the corner of Twitter that we're on is, like, like all these interests that I have, I don't really have many people in my personal life mm -hmm. that uh, have them. But on Twitter, I have tens and maybe even more than that uh, people who share the same exact interest as me. And we're all communicating with each other and sharing ideas. And I ask myself, uh, what does that metamorphosize into, right? Uh, because 20 years ago, this wasn't possible. And, you know, you look at the average 21-year-old today, uh, some of these guys blow my mind uh, with their intelligence and their maturity. And I, I could only wish that I knew some of these things at uh, 20, 22, 23, 24 years old. And I can't imagine uh, the people who utilize this technology that we have and this open source communication where we can communicate with like minds across the world. I can't imagine what that's going to develop into for the people who 
who actually use it correctly? Like, how exponentially are they going to develop? What are these people going to be like when they're my age or 60 years old? You get what I'm saying? It's going to be a crazy place. It's a scary thing to think about, man. It really is. Well, I super appreciate you coming on. I hope everyone got a lot of value because, I mean, that was that was great. It was fantastic. And I know that people's minds are going to be a little melted after this. So make sure you go check out uh, Michael on Twitter at Holder of the Fire. All the links are going to be dropped below. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you hit the subscribe button so I can bring you more interviews and fun talks like this. Hope you guys have I a beautiful will. day. Thanks for joining me again, brother. Thank you, bro. I really had a good time, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah.